we've heard taught on before, but I think is going to be very relevant for us this morning. Isaiah 6. So if you have your Bible, you can open it up. If you don't, that's okay. We should have all the text on the screen for you. We're going we're gonna to go through Isaiah kind of verse by verse and read it and then see what it might have to say to us about who this God is that we love and worship. I want to ask you a question really quickly before we jump in. If I were to ask you who is God, what would you say? What's the first word that would come to mind if I asked you who God is? We, we talk quite a lot about believing in God, and that's obviously very important. Our faith is in God. But I would say another very important question is what do we believe about God? What do we believe about God? Who is this God that we worship? Because there are lots of ideas out there. There are many other gods with their own identities. And there's something very different about the God that we worship and that we love, Yahweh. What do you believe about him? I think this is important for us. Yeah, so we're going to talk about encountering the Holy One. And there's a lot of implications. This is the God we're going to meet one day. That's why this is important. Because one day we're going to meet this God. And I think it's pretty important we get to know him now. And we have the unique opportunity in Christ to know who this God is. And the secondary implication is that is who we are meant to become. Not just when we see him face to face, but actually here and now, we begin this journey of becoming like this God whom we love and worship. Let's jump to the first slide. I think there's a couple implications of the nature of God for us. We're called into his likeness. That's a Genesis 1 principle, okay? So you don't actually know much about, at the beginning of the story in Genesis, you don't know much about God. You know a few things. He's powerful. He's the creator. But he gives us this special revelation that we are made in his image to be in his likeness. So by implication, whatever we see and believe about God, there's something in us meant to become like that as well like a father and a son, becoming like the father. The son is growing into that likeness. So we, the more that we know about God, who he is, the more we understand whose image we were made in and whom we're supposed to become like. Of course, it affects how we approach God. What kind of father, then, is this God? Is he approachable? Is he a tyrant? Is he absent-minded? Or is he wonderful, beautiful, holy, set-apart, amazing, beautiful, which the scriptures reveal. And of course, we're going to spend eternity with God. And if you knew who this God was, I think you'd be a little bit more excited for eternity and living for the kingdom now. There's many thoughts and ideas. Uh, Idolatry is when we try to create God in our own image. The opposite of that is idolatry. When we pick a God we like or define God as we like and we become like that, that's idolatry, which is the exact opposite of what the scriptures teach, which is we need to understand who this God is and he dictates that and we conform to his image through his own power. So these are totally different paths. We're going to see a little bit of something about this God in Isaiah 6. Now a little background, Isaiah was a priest and he's being called to be a prophet. He did not have an easy job. He was serving very, in very difficult times for Israel. You have the fear of the Assyrian Empire coming and the threat that they posed on Israel. There was fear of that. There's a transition from one king to another, as we'll see, Uzziah has died. And there's a transition of leadership And then in the spiritual sense, he's ministering among a very difficult people. You'll see that in the passage as well. They are deaf and blind. His commissioning was not an easy one. His audience was not an easy one. And yet God calls him into this uncertainty to be a prophet to speak for God. And there's a couple big themes just, I think, in Isaiah, but also in this passage. The humility that we must come to God because of the holiness of who he is. 
if he is who he says he is, <clears throat> we need to very humbly approach this God. And that's very central to the gospel and the message of Jesus. If God is what he says he is and who he says he is, that dictates how we come to him in humility, not in our own efforts, but in his own grace. All right, so let's jump into the passage. I'm going to read verse 1. Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sit, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. We sung about that just a few minutes ago. What's interesting about this, Uzziah, the king of Israel, had just died. The human king had just passed away, and now all of a sudden Isaiah is seeing the king of kings. I don't think that was an accident. I think it was an answer to maybe some uncertainty or some fear in his heart. What happens now? Because Uzziah was a good king. And as you know, Israel's history, they didn't always have good kings. And transitions between the kings could be uncertain. What will it be like now? Uzziah is considered one of the good kings who led the people to the Lord. And Isaiah would have known him. He would have mourned his death. He would have been sad to see the passing of a good king. And God is revealing something very important. God is sitting on a throne. That means he's the true king above all kings. And he's not running around frantically worried. Nothing has gotten, caught got God off guard. He's sitting calmly on his throne still in charge, he's still the king of kings, despite the many transitions or the fear of the Assyrian Empire coming or the deaf and blind people. God is still there, sitting on his throne. He does not pass, he does not move. He is the king of kings. There's assurance in that. Now something very interesting at, at the background is why Uzziah died. About 11 years earlier, despite being a good king, Uzziah, had tried to enter the temple uninvited and offer sacrifice incense. We don't exactly know his motivation. You can read this in Second Chronicles. But he enters the temple. The priests say, you cannot be here. This is, this is a work for the priest. You're uninvited. Uzziah, for whatever reason, comes in pridefully, thinking, I'm the king. I can do this. I want to worship. He offers incense. And the Lord uh, gives him leprosy as a punishment. He is punished for that act of pride in that moment of coming into the presence of God uninvited. That's very important. He tries to come into the presence of God in his own way uninvited, and he gets leprosy. He lives probably about another 11 years, and now he's died, probably because of that leprosy. So there's a direct connection here. Uzziah has died. Why did he die? Because he came uninvited. And now Isaiah is seeing the Lord on the throne. And you're going to see why he's a bit terrified. This is a dreadful experience, potentially, to be in the presence of the king of kings uninvited. In that culture, a king had all authority. You didn't have to ask permission. You could be executed. You could be exalted. You could be kicked out. You could be banished. They have absolute power when you are in their realm. And this is a fearful thing, but it can also be a delightful thing, as we'll see if we are made clean in his presence. So let's jump to verse 2. So if, if we cannot be in the presence of God, uninvited, in our own way, the question naturally is, well then, who can be in God's presence? Or how can people be in his presence? If God is the King of kings... Who is able to be in his presence? And verse 2 kinds of, kind of answers that for us. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. So there's angels. Air, uh, seraphim were like bearers of light. They were special, powerful angels. And they are in the presence of God. Meaning... God is far more powerful even than these angels. When humans interact with these angels, by the way, maybe not necessarily seraphim, but angels in general, 
usually the reaction is complete fear, terrified, falling down. And yet these angels, there's a holy fear in the presence of the king of kings for the angels. Who do they fear? They have their faces covered and their feet covered, showing a holy fear being in the presence of this king. There is absolute worship. There's this attraction. They're facing the the throne, the king of kings, and worshiping the king of kings, but also there's this covering of self, showing we're not worthy. We are in holy fear in the presence of this king. It's, It's a delight and it's a dread at the same time because they recognize the absolute power of this king who can do anything in heaven and on earth but also this beauty that attracts them to be there. They want to be there. They're not forced to be there. We know Satan uh, chose to leave, so they're not forced to leave there, to be there. They want to be there. There's something fascinating and beautiful and compelling about this God, but there's also this holy fear of, of pure power in the presence of God. And so we see that just in the, in the, in the nature of these angels being there. The closer we get to God, I think the more we want to worship. Isaiah, I think, is it just a vision or is it a real encounter? I think it was probably a real encounter in a sense that this was not ethereal. He was actually, in a sense that the temple was where the presence of the Lord would reside. He was a priest. Most likely this encounter happens as he's a priest ministering in the temple because that's where the presence of God would dwell. So he's probably in the temple and he has this vision, but it's very real. I think it's a little bit more than a vision. It's very tactile. It's very real for him. There's a trembling. And he's experiencing these things. I think he's getting a glimpse of heaven in this moment. And the closer we get, the more we want to worship God. So what are these angels who want to worship God the King of Kings, what are they saying about this God? This this is central to our message. Let's go to verse 3. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Now potentially they're saying other things as well, but this is what's recorded. This is not by accident. This is central to what the angels are saying about God. These angels spend their entire existence in the presence of the King of Kings. And so they know far more than we know. We have not had this experience. Someday we will, Lord willing. But they spend their existence in the presence of the King of Kings. So they know far more than us. And what are they saying is very, very interesting. They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now, saying it three times is is perfect. In a sense, they're perfectly holy. It also could reflect the the triune God, holy, 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 Father, Son, and Spirit. But it's a perfect holiness. Is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. People have tried to describe holiness and glory and what that means. I think one of the best analogies is simply thinking of the sun, the, the, the heat and the power of the sun is the holiness of God, and the glory is what radiates out of that. So because God is who He is, glory fills the earth. Glory radiates from that holiness. We reveal God, the angels reveal the glory of God, and what they're showing about God is fundamentally in who He is, is holiness. He is holy. So I think we need to understand a little bit about what holy means. What are these angels are saying? Why were they using this word? Holiness means separated. In the technical sense, it means separate, set apart, different, unique. Lots of people think holiness refers only to moral purity. It includes that, but it's far more than that, as we'll see. He is holy in power. He is holy in love. He is holy in every attribute. I don't think holiness is just an attribute. It's not just a characteristic, like I'm loving and God is more loving. He's not just a better version of us. If we talk, if we talk about love, for example, if, if on a scale of one to ten, I, I'm, a, I'm a two in my love and God is a ten. That's not what it means. 
it means it's not just characteristic, it's categorical. He's in a totally different category than us. This is very important. He's not just better at loving, he's actually the source of love. That's very different. He's not just powerful, he's the source of all power. So he's categorically different, unique. That's what's set apart. It doesn't mean better. It does include that, but it's categorically different, set apart. As in, there's a chasm. You cannot become like God. You cannot do anything. It is impossible for you to be as loving as God because He's the source and you are set apart. You cannot become in any way of your own as powerful as God. There's a chasm that is literally impossible to cross in any way because He's categorically set apart. That's, what, what, that's what's fascinating to the angels. In every way, in every sense, God is set apart. He's different. I like the translation other. He's just other. It's this blanket statement of we can't describe everything we're seeing, but wow, you're just other. You're amazing. You're set apart. You're one of a kind. You're unique. You're the source. You're everything. Infinitely more special and significant. So it's far more than just moral perfection. Of course, he is morally better. He's the source of morality. He sets the law in all of these characteristics. He's more powerful and wise and loving, but he is set apart in a way that we can never even comprehend, and I think that's important. So the word holy gets used in the Old Testament. The first time it's used is talking about the Sabbath, the seventh day. So we have the six days of the Sabbath is set apart to be different, unlike anything the other days. It's actually a day of the Lord for the Lord's purposes. It's set apart we get, we get an indication set apart for a purpose. Marriage, set apart, holy marriage, set apart for a purpose. The Holy Spirit, He's not just like our spirit, but better. He's completely set apart. He is completely <laughs> superior in every category. The Holy Spirit. So we talk about set apart for a purpose. He's wholly unique. Now we're going to get into what does that mean for us, but let me just say, it's a good thing that God has set apart. When we create God in our image, we're taking the easy route. A God that is unlike us, better than us, superior to us, that is a good thing for us. Because as we'll see, when he invites us into his presence, he's inviting us into a better place, not where we are. If God was just like us, we wouldn't be going anywhere better. But because he is wholly superior in his holiness, when he invites us into that, he's inviting us into paradise, perfection, holiness even. Okay, verse 5. Uh, oh, I, I skipped verse 4, but we'll say, And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Now let me read verse 5. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The King, the Lord of hosts, what we've been talking about. And look what Isaiah doesn't say. Oh, I'm so happy to be in paradise. Thanks for inviting me. There is nothing casual about this. There is nothing fun about this. This is absolutely terrifying because he recognizes he is unclean and unworthy to be there in that moment. And now, he is a priest. He probably would have been ceremonially clean to enter the temple. In every metric of human metric, he checks the boxes. He went through the ceremony to enter the temple, and he's a priest. He's set apart, and he does not feel worthy to be in the presence of the king. And, and whether it was intentional, he couldn't help it, but he just confesses his sin. Oh, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. In the presence of perfection, all uncleanliness is revealed. And it comes to surface. And that can be terrifying as imperfect, fallen people. And we know God can do whatever. And he's probably thinking, I'm guessing, we don't know for sure from the text, he might have been thinking about what happened to Uzziah who came into the presence of God uninvited, and he was given leprosy. And there was nothing unjust about that. That was fully justified. 
in the presence of a holy God, unholy people they be killed, they can get leprosy. There's an immediate recognition of the distance, the chasm between uh, God and us because of our sin, and we don't deserve to be there. Now, what God does is incredible. Maybe unlike what we think of a holy God. That's Isaiah's response, confess. I'm a man of unclean lips. And he says, woe is me. There's actually one translation um, in uh, the NLT that says, I am, woe is me, for I am doomed. He thinks he's going to die, is his initial reaction. Woe is me, for I am doomed. So he's in the presence of the king. What does the king then say or do? Let's look at verse 6. One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. This is about being covered, atoned for. He sends a mediator, an angel. Now listen, Isaiah did not say, cleanse me, cover me, for whatever reason. That wasn't even on his mind. He just thinks, woe is me, I'm doomed. I'm going to die in the presence of this God. So it's the initiation of God, that's very important, to come and atone for Isaiah's unrighteousness. God sends the seraphim. The seraphim comes with a burning coal and touches his lips. Verse 7, he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. You've been atoned for. The word atone means to be covered. It doesn't mean I don't care. It's not like God doesn't care about your sin. He was fully understanding. Isaiah was a sinner in the presence of a holy God. But God is saying, I will cover you. In this symbolic act of touching his lips with the coal, you've been covered. I will cover you. I will deal with this for you. Now this is fundamental to the gospel. We do not atone for ourselves. We cannot do anything in that state. Isaiah is recognizing, I'm going to die and there's nothing I can do because I'm unholy and I'm sinful. God has to, by nature, initiate a covering. That's the only way. The only way is for God to cover us. Isaiah, God didn't say, just do these five steps and you'll be good enough to be here. Because that's impossible. Isaiah didn't volunteer, uh, forgive me, uh, let, let me come back, let me work on this, I'll try harder, I'll be... There's nothing he can do. God has to do something. So the holiness of God, we talked about it's a good thing for us because his holiness includes his love. And it's in the holiness of God that compels him towards people, not away from people. The holiness of God is not mean he's isolated. It actually means he's compelled to come towards us and reconcile us and forgive us and cover us. That's the opposite of what a religious world would say. We would think in God's holiness he would be separate and we could never be like that. But actually his holiness invites fellowship, as we're going to see. For the sake of fellowship and for our commissioning, God actually draws near to Isaiah and he covers him symbolically. So a coal would have come from the fire symbolically. I think there's a lot to that in what we'll see with Christ. There had to fire for a sacrifice. There has to be something given up, sacrificed, in order to cover for sin. We know that from the Old Testament as well in the law. In order for us to be covered, there has to be a sacrifice. Something has to be given up for something to be gained. So that coal comes from the fire and it touches his lips. So we see God is over here, and Isaiah is over here, 
And this is actually the question of, of the Old Testament is in Israel, is they, they, if they were paying attention, God is far superior, we're sinful, how on earth can we ever be in fellowship with a holy God? That, that's really the question of the Old Testament, and this paradox. We know he's good, we know he's loving, we know, but we are sinful and fallen away. How on earth is this ever going to be reconciled? Because unholiness cannot mix with holiness. So something has to happen. And this is the, the, the symbolic prophetic of what Christ will do permanently in his atonement on the cross. And there's this really neat cryptic prophecy, I would say, in Isaiah 48, 17. It says, the Redeemer is the Holy One. The Redeemer is the Holy One. So the one who redeems humanity is the Holy One. I think that was a paradox, but God is showing something very important if you're paying attention. God himself is actually going to come over here into the likeness of man to become a sin offering and to bring mankind back to himself. We are already in, the, in his image. God is becoming like us in our weakness to draw us back into God's holiness. So it's there in the Old Testament. This is not new when Christ appears and done, does this, but I think it's uh, often misunderstood. But it says, Isaiah 48, 17, very important. The Redeemer is the Holy One. The same one over here is the one who comes over here to bring us back to here. That is the Gospel. All right, let's look at verse 8. So God atones Isaiah... And everything changes. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Minutes earlier, Isaiah was saying, Woe is me, I'm going to die. And now he's saying, Here I am, send me. The atonement changes everything about our capacity and ability to come in the presence of God. This is potentially within a matter of minutes or seconds. This is happening the atonement changes everything. He's not, look, I mean, how stark of a difference, woe is me, I'm going to die, to here I am, send me. Something had shifted fundamentally in his interaction with God. Now look, the angels, I think this is interesting for whatever, the angels don't say, they're not volunteering either. I think there's a lot to this, but why is Isaiah volunteering because he had just experienced covering. God's covering is an invitation into fellowship. That's God inviting Isaiah into fellowship. That act shows Isaiah, God wants him to be in his presence. I want to be with you. I'm committing myself to you. And when Isaiah experiences that, that's, a, that's an entire shift in our soul, in our nature, in our, in our mind, in our heart. And I think... The same heart that God has to redeem an unholy people has now been infected into Isaiah's heart so that he can go back and redeem an unholy people. He wants to go back. In the same way, God wants to redeem Isaiah. Now Isaiah is infected with that same heart of holiness to go out of his way, to go back to a holy people and see them redeemed. I mean, he could have said, uh, actually, I'd rather just stay here if that's all right. <laughs> I don't really want to go back. I'm fine being here in your presence. I will go for you. He's experienced something very special, and he wants to now go back. This is really his commissioning. Jeremiah has a similar experience in his commissioning. This is a very real, very profound uh, uh, start to his prophetic ministry. And I think why Isaiah was so committed was because of this experience and why he was able to minister in such a difficult time. I think there's many things relevant today as well. So God is calling people out for a purpose. So when we read, uh, Vernon read uh, 1 Peter, be holy for I am holy. That's an invitation into, the fellow, into fellowship with God that's only possible because of Christ. We're invited into fellowship with God and that invitation is for a purpose not to be isolated, but to be sent out. 
The same pattern with Isaiah is the same pattern we see with the church and Christ's commissioning. We'll talk about that at the end. There's a purpose to our holiness. Yes, the fellowship with God because he wants to be with us, but also to share in God's heart and purposes for his people. There's a commissioning. So now he's going to get this commissioning. And now I don't know what he was thinking. He, by the way, he volunteers before he knows what he's being called to do. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if he would have changed his mind. This is not an easy commissioning. Let's go to verse 9. And he said, this is God saying, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn to be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. This is a very difficult calling. I don't know if Isaiah understood everything that was in that. He certainly would have agreed with God that the people are stubborn and difficult and blind and deaf. I think Isaiah would have agreed in that. But essentially, God is saying, proclaim who I am, proclaim this message, but understand it's not going to change their hearts, in a sense. That's very interesting. and may seem paradoxical or unlike what we'd expect, but essentially, God is saying, the time is not yet. And I think he's actually revealing something very profound. We see in Ezekiel, we see um, uh, in, in, in other places, we actually need a new heart. We actually have to be reborn. This is the question of Jesus and Nicodemus. You actually have to be reborn. You need a new heart. Isaiah's words were not going to be enough to change the whole nation of Israel and bring them back to God because they fundamentally needed something more than just to be better people. They needed a new heart and spirit within them. And only God can do that. Isaiah is not God. He cannot make them holy. Even though his message was true and his works were good and he was doing it for the Lord, the time was not yet because the Redeemer is the Holy One. And Isaiah is not the Holy One. The time is not yet. So there's this waiting, this uncomfortableness, this ministering, laboring in a difficult place, in a difficult time. And God is basically saying, it's not yet. I will be the one who does the greater work and gives them a new heart and a new spirit and ultimately reconciles this chasm between them and me. And Isaiah takes that commissioning. He does it faithfully until the end of his life and gives his life for this commissioning. This is not an easy thing for him. Israel rejects the message. But God is saying in this next verse, as we'll see, there's, there's a seed, a holy seed, a message of hope. He doesn't leave Isaiah with hopelessness altogether. Verse 13, And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Again, this is a little bit cryptic, but God is saying Israel is going to go through refining, through a fire. It's going to be difficult. Your message is going to be rejected. Their hearts are not fully going to change, but out of that burnt tree, that destroyed tree, there will be a seed that will eventually bear fruit and fulfill the purposes that I have. Your work is not fruitless. It may be delayed, but it's not fruitless, and a holy seed will come about, and I believe that is Christ, the holy seed, who then grafts in a holy people of faith. That is a foreshadow to Christ, who will fulfill this ultimate work and be the Redeemer and the Holy One who brings Israel and the church back to God. We see this fulfilled in Revelation 4 and 5. It's interesting, in Revelation 4, 8, 
we see angels singing around the throne, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. So however many hundreds of years have gone by, because this is a, this is a future vision of John. John is seeing, um, and obviously Isaiah is in the past, hundreds of years, and the angels are still saying the same thing. You're holy. So in Isaiah's time, and in Micah's time, and Jesus' time, and in future time, God is still holy. He's always holy. He's unchanging. He was holy then. He's holy now, and he will always be holy. We get this amazing connection, holy, 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 again and still is the Lord Almighty. But this time, there's people around the throne. There are elders. That was not in Isaiah's vision. There are elders, people around the throne. How is that possible? God must have done something to allow people in his presence. And what are they saying about Christ, the Lamb? Revelation 5, this is about the Lamb coming to the throne. Revelation 5, 9. And they sang a new song. This is a new song. God has done something spectacular, and they're singing a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seal. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Now, this is, there's a lot to that. But what's happened? The gospel. Jesus Christ has come and died and reconciled once and for all humanity to a holy God. And he's done far more than Isaiah could ever have done. This is far bigger than just the nation of Israel now. This is every tongue, tribe, and people now. Through Christ, the Holy Seed has now ingrafted a people of faith from all over the world. This is a far bigger vision than we initially thought. And now, there is a way for unholy people to be in the presence of a holy God. Christ has rectified this barrier. Let's go to the last slide. So what does this mean for us? This is a beautiful picture of how we interact with a holy God. I think there's two main things as you guys are thinking about prayer and fasting and coming to a holy God um, and how we come to God. We need to see him as holy and we need to come humbly. I think there's this pattern uh, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, of going into the presence of God and being sent out on mission with God. There's this going in and there's this coming out. And I think that's a, a prayer and fasting. You can see it in terms of you're not going and seeking the Lord to stay there forever. We're in the presence of God. God's heart is still for the lost. And as long as there are lost and he has plans to redeem them, he's going to want to send us back to be for the world, in the world, for the world, for the glory of God. So we're not just there to stay there because it's beautiful and comfortable, but we're there to be filled and commissioned so that we can go out for the sake of the lost. So as you come into the presence of God, be confident in Christ's covering and only in Christ's covering. There is no other way in which we can be saved but through Christ's covering. And it is a strong and perfect covering. Ephesians 3.12, Christ gives us confidence to approach him. Confidence, con fide, meeting with faith. We can come in faith, through faith in Christ, and only faith in Christ, into the presence of God and approach him. There's a confidence that we can, as children approaching the Father, we don't need to have the same reaction as Isaiah because the atonement has already taken place, and we have a complete and perfect covering to approach our Father. So, in prayer, fasting, sacrifice, laboring, toiling, everything that we do, it is not a religious act in order to gain access into the presence of God. That's very important. It is not a religious act to gain God's favor favor into His presence, because He has already granted that to us. It's not an effort we can do by ourselves. It has to be given to us, and it has been given to us 
through faith in Christ. That fundamentally shifts how you approach God. I'm not doing this to earn you favor so that you'll accept me. We're already accepted fully in and through Christ, but only in and through Christ. So don't come to God in any other way. Come in humility, but praise and worship and thanks that Christ has made a way. And when he says be holy, remember it's an invitation to intimacy. God's holiness is not isolation. God's holiness actually fundamentally is fellowship. The triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, forever in perfect fellowship. That's fundamental to his holiness is relationship. And God is pouring out that desire for intimacy upon his people. So we are not an isolated people either. We don't get saved and we're immediately transported up to heaven and taken away. We are kept here intentionally, like Isaiah, for the purposes of God to reach the lost because God's heart is fundamentally for fellowship. And the barrier is our sinfulness because of his holiness and Christ is the answer to that. So we can pray with confidence to our Father. Jesus teaches that. We see that very clearly. Pray with faith to your Father because of what Christ has done. And the second thing is be courageous in your commissioning. Isaiah was confident, here I am, send me, because his commissioning had come from God himself. We can be courageous, full of heart, not fearful, in our commissioning because it comes from God. Because we've been covered, we can be confident and courageous in our commissioning. I want you to think about this image of the Olympics. If you watched or not, you understand hopefully the idea these athletes are chosen by their country not just to show how wonderful the athletes are. The point is actually they represent a nation. The athletes are chosen by their country to represent the nation. That's, <laughs> you know, uh, hopefully it's not about the individual. It's about the nation they represent. There's a respect. There's a pride in the country. There's a similar uh, idea with being called out as saints. Saints means the holy ones. So we wear the jersey. We have the kit. Christ has covered us. So when we interact with the world, it's not about us. It's about the kingdom which we represent. So we're not called out to be uh, 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 snobby and separated. We're called out and into the world to represent the kingdom of whose uh, robe we represent, the covering that we have, the kit, if you like football. We have the kingdom kit on because of Christ's covering. And that changes everything about our commissioning. It's not about us. It's not about us. It's God's work, and he's chosen us to participate. We can be courageous in it. We can be sacrificial, even, in our pursuit of others because our greatest joy is in the glory of God. This absolutely compels our proclamation of the good news and the gospel. The good news for the world is not just that God is holy, but God's holiness has compelled him to come to us in the person of Christ and to reconcile man with God once and for all. So as we come in, let us feast on the goodness of God. Let us behold the glory of God. And, and, and love the presence of God, but remember that he sends us out into sacrificial mission and labor and worship in the field. The harvest is ripe because he still wants to see souls saved in fulfillment of that revelation in the future that one day all tongue, tribe, and nation will worship around the throne proclaiming Christ the Lamb who is worthy, and he has once and for all reconciled sinful man with a holy God. Amen. Let me pray, and then, Paul, you can come back up. Father, thank you for that word, that you are the one who does all the work, and we joyfully participate, Lord. We are pleased to be in your presence, Lord. Thank you for inviting us, covering us, sanctifying us. Would you make us more like you each day? Lord, I pray that this word would change us, Compel us into sacrifice, into love for your glory. 
Lord, thank you for this church. Continue to grow it and, and, and grow us in like-mindedness, the mind of Christ, in love, in fellowship. Make us more like you. We want to be like you, God. Your holiness is beautiful and wonderful, and we want to share that with you. We thank you for that gift. In Jesus' name, amen.